guys. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for all coming in today to Campus Safety Forum. I know a lot of you. Uh, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Jonathan Artel. I'm a member of Beverly's ASB. And, uh, and what, we, what we're doing here today is we want to give you guys an opportunity to get informed on campus safety and, most importantly, to give your own voice in the process. So what we have today is we have some you know, amazing speakers who volunteer their time to be here. Um, and what we're going to, what they're going to do is they're going to try and give you a picture of where we're currently at in terms of campus safety, the new measures that we'd like to take to ultimately get to where we want to be, um, and then uh, after that, you guys will have the opportunity to ask questions and share any concerns or input you guys have, so that you guys can help drive any changes in this process. So, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Mr. Mead, who's going to. Why don't we have our guest? Oh, everyone introduce yeah. yeah. awesome. Thank you. Okay, my name is Captain Mark Miner. Um, I'm the operations division commander for uh, for the police department. What does that mean to you? I I have uh, I run uh, four bureaus that you're probably very familiar with. What they do. I have a patrol bureau, which are those officers that generally patrol the street. So I have a traffic bureau, which I'm sure uh, some of you drivers are very familiar with. There's uh, wonderful motor officers out there that conduct regular traffic enforcement. And also, uh, the traffic control officers are part of that bureau as well, the ones that stand in front of the schools and help uh, your parents move traffic along and get you in and out of your cars and all of that. So that's the other bureau. The other two bureaus, uh, I have the commanders here. Uh, I have a detective bureau. And uh, uh, the detective bureau also is our bureau that has our youth services detail that um, houses our SROs, our, which currently are, those of you who may be familiar with Stephanie Frias, she's uh, our current SRO. Uh, we also have you know, UV Mendoza, and he is our juvenile detective who also works for Lieutenant Dave Hamill. And then uh, I have also brought with me uh, Lieutenant Mike Hill. Mike Hill runs our Special Investigations uh, Bureau, which uh, has a number of responsibilities. One of them, uh, the most important aspect of it is related to the schools, is he, his People conduct a lot of the training, uh, the first, res or not just first responder training, but the, uh, um, the uh, um, what is it you do with these schools? You do the active shooter training. He does active shooter training for the schools. In addition to that, he's also the SWAT uh, commander for the police department. So, thank you. Okay, folks, so um, I think. The main idea here is to open it up for you guys to hear some information and maybe ask some questions. Is there anybody who would like to begin? Do you have a question about anything right now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hello, Sam Brown. Uh, yeah. oh, man or ma'am? I said ma'am, but... So sorry, Dr. <laughs> you're good, you're good. All right, Maya, go ahead. In regards to the little panic last Thursday night, yeah. um, what have the police department done because there were a lot of opinions and you know facts floating around on the internet and by mouth on that day and so I just wanted to know exactly what the police have done that they can share with us. Would you like to answer that? Good. All right. Uh, in case you're not aware, obviously juvenile law is a little bit different than adult law, so it's a little bit more restrictive in what we're allowed to put out there. Sometimes that's negative because when you have a situation like this and everybody wants to know information and needs to know certain information, whether they're going to be safe or not, right? That's a, that's a big deal for you guys. Um, so what I can tell you about that incident is we have fully investigated it and we don't feel that there's any threat uh, pertaining to that specific incident. So I can tell you that, and we've looked at all aspects. Uh, we looked at uh, uh, a certain individual who was also uh, drew our attention, and again, we vetted out all portions of uh, his life, and uh, we're, we're very satisfied that there's not going to be a problem there. Did that answer your question, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, Sam Bernstein. Um, so the other day, or today actually, um, there's the play in the Salty Theater, and I was walking out of the play towards the science building, and I looked to my right, and there was a huge crowd of kids, and there's a driveway to the school, no security, no fence, literally nothing there. 
And I don't want to be like a narc, but it is so easy to come into the school and it's so concerning because we are Beverly Hills High School and unfortunately that carries kind of a, a poor label. And I wouldn't want that to end in a bad result and I think it is so easy to get into the school. What can, what can you guys promise us to change that and to change the narrative here? Because I've, there's no fence, there's literally nothing. No, I think that's more of a high school question yes. than it is an yeah. HPD question. Um, I would like to say, though, that um, Thursday and Friday of last week, whether it, I think the uh, peninsula thing was Thursday, is, is yeah. that right? Yeah. 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 I mean, last week was crazy, right? As, as you guys all know, and I, I want to thank each and every one of you um, who suffered from any anxiety and fears for, you know, being brave and talking to us and expressing your fears and concerns. You know, being open is what we're all about, student voice, st student communication. This room's never been this full. Um, you mentioned the fence. Um, I can tell you that there's a very real urgency about that right now. Um, and I can tell you also that um, there are people in this room, uh, ASB included, who have, been, uh, who have enjoyed this conversation with me about putting up a fence and turning this campus, perhaps not 100% closed, um, into a campus that is secure. Um, I'm ready to do that. And uh, ASB knows I'm ready to do that. And it wasn't very long ago that we had, it was the day of the fires with all the uh, smoke in the air. I actually went into ASB to talk to him about that. And it, we started talking about the fence. Um, you understand that one of the big implications of the fence is a change of our daily habits. You understand that, right? So security will change how they exercise their responsibilities. Um, for example, you might see security somewhat frequently driving folks around and being super helpful, which is great, right? But if they're man in a post that has to be secured, they can't do that, right? And we're, we're preparing for that. Um, we put up that fence, my friends, and when you have to go from Mr. Boucher's science room to PE, you're gonna have to go up past the village, down the stairs, and I'm glad for that. And you can ask ASB, I've been glad for this for a long time. Um, that's what a secured campus is gonna look like. Um, and while I am heartbroken at the feelings of angst that the students are expressing, um, while I'm heartbroken, obviously, for the folks in Florida, I do think that this is a positive thing coming out of this. We're going to get that fence, and it's going to happen soon. And I am um, working very closely to do it in the right way. Um, putting a fence is one thing. Is it going to have appropriate signage? Are people in the JPA and the city going to be ready for this change? Are students going to be ready? And I think we are. I think if I had tried to put that fence in three months ago, there would have been a great deal of disgruntlement. People saying, why can you do this? And now it looks like a prison and this and that. And now the, the dialogue's changed and I think it's a right moment to put in that fence. Um, I have to say, I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to put it in. Because if you ask around, if you're on the, students, uh, the school site council, I've been talking about it for months. And uh, there's a lot of people like, yeah, that's a good idea, but what about the, it, now people are ready. And so there's a positive. Um, you mentioned uh, the play. I want you to know that this morning, I went over to the district office and said, I absolutely positively need to have a second person on campus in the evenings. It just has to happen. Because our security tends to prioritize this, the athletic area where there's a lot of people. They hang out in the front, there's sports teams, there's JPA, there's just a lot of stuff going on. But there shouldn't be a priority between one or the other. They should both be covered. Um, so we will have um, a security guard. Certainly, the duration of the play, including rehearsals like tonight. And I am very vigorously talking about, do we not just have one person on both parts of the campus every night? So you have a, a very important question. Um, and I hope that at least partially answers it. Folks, it, it, the implications are, are going to be a little bigger than you think with the fence, right? Um, for example, what about entry into the school via car? Right? Which is something people have been talking about. One of the things we're toying with is we just locked that gate after 8.15. Right? So you want to drive onto campus and you're late, somebody's got to open that gate for you. Okay? Um, it's not the end of the world, but again, these are things that could potentially be frustrating. Where do your, your parents park? Are they parking the guest parking? Right? Who's going to take them here? Well, maybe the valet system doesn't work anymore if we have specific guards and specific posts. Does that mean your parents have to walk all the way from visitor to the glass double doors. It's inconvenient. And some people are gonna be like, dude, I totally understand. Some people are gonna be less understanding. So this is gonna be an evolution. We're gonna need your support. So I'm assuming every single one of you in here are concerned about safety. Every single one of you in here is saying that fence, we need to feel protected. So we're gonna need your support when these habits change. 
okay? We need a positive groundswell. We're gonna have to say, look, yes, the walk to Boucher, all the way down to PE, takes 10 minutes, 28 seconds if you stop and use the restroom and open up your locker. Well, we can do that, you can make it. You can make it faster if you just move a little faster. But we, we've tried it out, we've measured how many extra steps, and we've done all that, and it's, it's doable. But it's gonna be an adjustment for everybody. Um, but if you go to any other high school, you will find that what you guys deem a prison is very common. In fact, I would say the vast majority of schools, they're insulated. They stay secured until the day is over. And that's what we're changing to, and I'm grateful for this opportunity. Can I ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Great. <coughs> yes, sir. So, you say that people would have to wait for someone to come over and open a fence. Uh, what if there's an emergency and an ambulance needs to get into school? There's someone there. The, the gates will be manned. There will be a human being right there. It just won't be permanently open. It would need to be opened by the guard to let the appropriate people in and out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Sir. Uh, so once the fence is put into place, what will the exits and entrances be? And also, will areas like the swim gym and the front lawn be fenced off? Good question. Um, will swim gym and the front lawn be fenced off? I believe the answer to that question is most likely yes. I've been advocating for a fence across Heath, strategically placed this, this right here, lower down so that we can control traffic a little better. But I do believe part of the dialogue involves the possibility of having a much longer fence that covers all the way across the grass, which would be great if you are a lacrosse person practicing there because those balls are flying out. Um, it's not gonna look necessarily spectacular instantly, but the actual <coughs> long-term fence that's part of the plans is quite beautiful. It's like wrought iron, it looks quite lovely. That's not next week, obviously. Um, I do think if you're gonna bother to go through the front lawn, which doesn't secure anything, you're gonna continue up through the um, athletic area. Which again, if you imagine everybody hanging out in front of the swim gym, right, which is where you guys like to hang out, I totally get it. It's completely open to the traffic right there. Um, I think we had one episode, silly, but like, a stink bomb might have flown into an open car, right? That means a student and a person of the community just have a little bit of a negative interaction. That fence would help with that. It just doesn't feel great. I get that. But um, I, I believe that's part of the plan. I'm vigorously advocating for the one on heat. I think that's important, but that longer fence probably is part of the plan and it's probably better for securing our campus. Yes? Um, why is there only So actually, uh, we're recruiting for a second school liaison officer, and that's uh, uh, that's the staffing level that the police department is maintaining. So it's two school two, uh, two school resource officers, uh, two uh, juvenile detectives, and uh, in addition to that, of course, in the field every day we have those patrol officers that will be assigned to the individual schools on a daily basis. And if I could say one thing about our school resource officers, they're incredibly responsive. I'm talking about Officer Frias right now, who's been amazing, she's great, great partner. Um, when we text her or need her, she's here. Um, she has the, the great touch of like, you know, being you know, a police officer, but also, you know, getting to know kids and, you know, being part of the community. I mean, so it's like this kind of dual role, which is great. Um, so she's been wonderful. Detective Mendoza's been wonderful. So I'm very happy with the relationship. In fact, um, on that Thursday, when people became very concerned about um, an alleged uh, Snapchat or Facebook, some kind of post, right? Um, I think it, it started at like 7.45 and uh, we had officers in our office, AM, and we had officers in our office by 7.47. I mean, it was that fast. Um, so the response time was great um, and the relationship is good. So we're very happy with how it's working out so far. Well, the good news is um, we, uh, here at the high school, we're, we, we really want to advocate for students having a voice and using that voice, and many students have said that they feel strongly about this walkout. Now, it's at a very unfortunate time in that it is on career day, and career day is uh, Ms. Dubin specifically, Ms. Redston specifically, they put hours and hours and hours into giving you an awesome experience on career day. It's a great day. The last thing we want to do is blow that thing up. 
but we also want to support student voice. So what, I've, what we've done, working with ASB and Jonathan Artal, is we've designed a new bell schedule for that day with 17 minutes plus like some walking time built into the bell schedule. So we, are we, we don't want to stifle student voice. We want to encourage it. We want it to be productive and on campus and safe. So, and not disruptive to the academic environment. So we've designed a schedule, literally, like an assembly, essentially. We've designed a schedule to allow students to exercise this opportunity for free speech without disrupting the educational environment. So security, um, we are also working with them to try to understand exactly where they're going, right? And um, I believe ASB is working on that. Yeah, you, I, you, I can elaborate on, on that please. now. Let's sure. So, so, um, thank you. So uh, we, we're really planning this as we speak, ASB had a conversation about this about 30 minutes ago. Um, and so the first thing that I want to talk about is the schedule. We will have a walkout, it will be March 14th, and it will be at 10 a.m., which is the nationally designated time where all high schools are walking out. Um, and so what that means is on career day, you have three career day sessions. You go to, you know, see a dentist, you see a lawyer, you see something else. So you're going to have your first session at about 9.05 to 9.50. And after that, we have a 10-minute nutrition, we have 19 minutes scheduled for walkout, and then we have a 10-minute passive period. And so what that means is we're gonna have about 10 minutes to get everyone uh, to meet right at the entrance to the village, and we're gonna do a march down Heath Avenue to the Science Building, um, and then from there, we're gonna have a couple of speakers. Uh, we don't want it to be ASB speakers, we wanna open it up to any student here who's passionate about the topic, uh, who's passionate about campus safety, gun violence in general, we want to open it up to them and allow them the opportunity to speak. Uh, so, so basically the layout for the day is that around 9.55 we'll start marching. We'll be down at the Science Building patio by 10 o'clock. We can have a speaker stand up right around the, um, where the Psalter is on that sort of raised dais. Um, so we'd like to have two student speakers and maybe either a staff speaker or someone from the city council. Um, and you know, of course pay our respects to the people who lost their lives and emphasize the need for actionable change, not only nationally, but in our community as well. So that, that's the general plan for the day. Um, so is, is, this, is this just about that? Uh, just a comment and a question for, for, the, for, for I'm sorry? Uh, a comment and a question. Sure. So um, I want to say thank you to ASB and Mr. Mead for creating this small schedule, because through promoting the walkout on Instagram and Facebook, I see that there are so many kids out there who want to get involved, and we really want this. And also I have another question that since social media now is such a big thing and we students were the first one to recognize that there's a disturbing post online relating to the school like the Snapchat, I think it was probably a student that reported that. And so if we see a similar post online after um, in the future, what is the fastest way to get to you or to get to someone who can do something about it? Thank you, Maya, for that question. Before I answer that, can I finish the last topic? And I absolutely want to answer that. Um, so the walkout, guys. Um, we had a walkout not especially long ago. I think it was last year um, related to, I think, the presidential election. I don't know if you recall. Um, it was in the second. Or it was a rally. And I want to say, you know, that was a very kind of emotional thing, right? There are some people who felt very strongly one way or another. And that rally, in my opinion, was excellently done by our students. You, you were passionate um, and controlled, and there was no violence or throwing. I mean, you, you guys were great. Please remember, um, and I know you won't forget, that um, this, this walkout that you're doing, which we support, um, is very much about a very serious, very emotional topic. And we have every expectation, and we know that you guys are going to be awesome Beverly Hills kids, um, that you're going to represent our school and yourselves in a way that's respectful of what was a tragedy. So um, we certainly support it. We know you're going to be great. But I um, just want to emphasize that, that this is a very solemn, you know, borderline sacred thing that you're doing. And I, I hope and I know that we're all going to take it seriously. Now, you want to know about the protection, the police, the security. Yeah. So we feel, you know, we, we have our perimeter. Um, the Olympic gate is closed. There's, you know, we feel very secure that you guys are going to be perfectly safe at the top near the village. You're going to be coming down into the STC, which essentially looks out onto Moreno. We expect that all students are going to stay on campus during this march. That is an expectation. We're not worried that you are going to defy that because of this solemn endeavor that you're doing. 
So you're going to stay on campus. You're going to be awesome. We do expect um, Heath to be pretty crowded with people, so there won't be any cars coming. You know, we'll, we'll stop the traffic. Um, but we will invite um, law enforcement. Um, by the way, this, as Mr. Artal said, they don't even know about this yet, so they haven't had time to chime in. But I'm sure we um, will get some support, probably right out in front. Now, that will probably not be to keep you in, but, you know, just the perception of keeping you safe right there in this, like, you know, so, but I can assure you that we will have adults, whether it's administration, whether it's our security, we'll all be there, um, as we always would. Um, you know, the SDC was always one of the options, and it's one that we, we are prepared for, but we hadn't hammered it out yet. So, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to talk with BHPD at all. Um, this would be the first they've heard of it. But, you know, even if they can't make it for some reason, we, we have, we'll have all our security force there. We'll have teachers there. You, I mean, you'll be, you'll be safe, just like you're. We keep you safe as much as we can all the time. Um, you know, and their response time is very fast, and very efficient. So I can't say that they'll be there, but they'll certainly be invited. But even if they can't. Well, I, I, you know, we can tell you that yeah, we actually know about it. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Because we are very connected with the school. So they brought it to my attention, and we will have a we will have a presence at the event. And again, it's not it, it's not to uh, do anything other than to provide security for the event. That's all. Um, now, Maya, your question was about Snapchats and like concerning like one of the things that I have received from a, a couple students. Um, thankfully, not many of you, but there was a perception with some kids that um, administration was not listening to student fears last week. Um, there were some people who even suggested the school should have been closed. And as our officers have just said, um, we work closely with them and they, and so frankly, so did we, did not deem that there was an immediate threat. Um, and so, but we, and I can't tell you, if you saw Chief Spagnoli's letter out, I think the number was close to 100 that was put in that letter. And I can vouch that on this campus, myself, my admin team talked to literally every single person we could find who said that they saw the post. One after the other after the other. And it was emotional. Like kids were distraught. I hope, and I don't think we gave any kid the impression, why are you wasting our time? Okay? So a big part of this is we want, it, we want you to reach out. Now, I, I admit that Thursday and Friday, the volume of reaching out got to a point where we couldn't keep up. Um, it got pretty crazy. But I, I hope no one ever received a message that we didn't want to hear it, right? I mean, I, I don't think we delivered that, certainly not face-to-face. -face. If you emailed us and we didn't respond, it wasn't because we didn't want to hear it, but the volume got pretty intense. Um, on Thursday night at home, I mean, it was, it was an onslaught. It was pretty crazy. Um, again, I appreciate student advocacy and voice. I mean, that's, you're gonna, if you know me from ASB, you know I believe that. I want you guys to believe that your voice matters. That's why we have these transparency meetings. That's why I support them. So let us know. So the fastest way, email your AP and principal and counselor. I mean, that's, that's it for anything. If you have a problem in your class, email your counselor and your, you know, CC your AP. Like that's, well, that's not true. Talk to your teacher first. You know, be mature, work it through. You know, but I mean, like urgent things. Tell your AP. Tell your counselor. You can CC me, but it's, it's a good thing to go through your AP first. So, like I said, we listened to voice. We really did. We investigated every single one. I can't tell you Thursday and Friday. It was nonstop. And I got to say that we were in conjunction with BHPD. They were also tirelessly following. I, would, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say every lead. Um, I worked with Officer Frias all those two days. So, please just keep your voice going. Yes. I just wanted to add to that because my I agree it's so important that students feel comfortable and they share because we, I really want to empower you because you are our eyes and our ears and absolutely contact your administrators contact your counselors we want you to feel comfortable to come you can always come into Norman Aid but if you ever do feel nervous and you don't feel comfortable speaking to an adult you can go on to Norm Anonymous and you can anonymously make a report and we'll follow up on that as well yeah, just, uh, just to follow up on that, we're aware that, uh, that some students may have a reluctance to communicate directly with us because we tend to know, that we tend to be able to find out who's, who's communicating with us and we have just have ways of doing that. But we are actually working on uh, uh, 
platform that will provide uh, an opportunity for you to provide us directly anonymous uh, information. And we're going to put that out. We're looking at a couple different possible platforms right now that uh, that we'll pa pass out to all the student body, teachers, and, and staff here at the school, so that you can feel comfortable. If you, for whatever reason, if you are uncomfortable letting us know who you are, you can feel comfortable that it's anonymous, and we'll be able to get the information where it needs to be, so that we can quickly take action on it. And we are very quick, and we will take action, day or night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's what we do. And, and just so you know, we take every one of these threats as a real threat until we determine that it's not, there's no validity to it. So we don't dismiss it uh, on face value. We literally look at it as it's a real threat and then we work to either confirm that it is or isn't and then we make a determination. And obviously if it, if it is a real threat, we would take some uh, pretty quick measures to ensure your safety. But what we find in most cases is, uh, and fortunately in most cases, they aren't valid threats. But we do need you to provide that information to us. It's a, it's a huge help. And I know with Snapchat, if you take a screenshot, it tells the person who sent it that you took a screenshot. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Bean. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. So anyway, you know, but if you can, great. If you can find out a way to, to, to preserve that information for us, uh, it's a big help. Yeah, no. Uh, so two quick things. Um, first, uh, Lily Bossy's watching live here. She wanted us to let you know that she's going to be marching. She mentioned that, so she's saying that. Uh, and second, uh, to the police, thank you for coming here today. And a quick question as to, uh, I know it's more presence in the mornings here with the police. Is that kind of part of a standard protocol now, or what's... Uh, uh, I noticed there's more police presence at the front now uh, in the mornings. Is that part of a standard protocol, or what's happening with that? Yes, it is. You'll find it actually all of the schools we maintain a, a presence around the schools. Uh, in addition to the traffic control officers, and I'm sure you all probably understand the difference between the two, but we have uh, we do have a police presence at every single school at uh, in the morning and at drop off, and uh, also throughout the day. As you know, um, Officer Prius is here. Uh, Detective Mendoza is here, and uh, I believe uh, just yesterday, the uh, we are soliciting uh, internal interest for this for the second resource officer that closed yesterday. So we'll be making selection soon and conducting training for that uh, that next officer. Yes, yeah. so um, I understand that like we're putting in a fence to make it harder for like random people to go along. Obviously, that's directed that's over over here. Um, first off, you, you said that the, the fence is to keep folks off, right? And and I get that, but I do want to emphasize that when I was advocating for this fence, it was as much to keep kids safe on campus. Meaning, when you have a porous campus and folks can just walk off, you know, th there are probably more statistically realistic dangers there yeah. than the fence hopper, um, but. Um, you know, obviously people have talked about metal detectors and, um, you know, I'm not going to weigh in on that, you know, um, that's a, that's a question that I think can go over my head and be part of a community discussion. Um, but yeah, I'm, you're, you're worried that somebody would put it in your backpack and walk in. Yeah, like, I don't know, I just feel like it'd be easy, especially if someone like drive, if it's in the car, into a spot, I don't know, it's just... I, I don't really... I don't know if entirely disagree, you. but you know, I would say that once again, like one of the most important things that I think we've learned in this situation is we're watching out for each other. Like this is a community thing. You know, you you know the kids in your classes. You you know. I mean, we, we need your help as much as anybody. Uh, yes. So the statement is. Um, if somebody does bring something with this fence or locked on campus, I would like to disagree with that for um, the, the places where you can exit and enter, if you think about it, if you count them up right now, from here right now, 
I mean, off, on your hand, how many can you count? How many ways can you run off campus? Not really. You go down, you go keep one way or the other, right? Where else? Like you can go out keep that way, you can go out keep that way. You can go through the salter and out that thing, right? So I was just talking to some folks about it. One of the plans right now is because we are worried about that. Like say you're in the band room, right? And there's a fire in the salter and you can't get out that way, you're trapped. There, that way is another way out. You can create a gate that opens from the inside and think about it just for a sec, sorry. Uh, the gate opens from the inside but it locks from the outside. Right? And it has an alarm on it, so you're going to use it in the case of emergencies. You can't just use it whenever you want. But those types of things are, are in consideration. So uh, you will not have less ways of egress. But ingress will be limited. You, you feel know I me? Mean? But of course, like the people who are making these plans are experts in these types of things. I am only an expert in the flows of our student traffic. So I go in there and I make sure they know where students go, what they do. They make sure that we're meeting all the emergency exits, but I literally just had a conversation with some of our people about that very thing, and they had the, they had it all set up, so that door alarmed up, ready to go. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, regarding the band room, so that room in general is really insecure. Like the door doesn't lock at all, even if it's locked, you can still open it if you push hard enough. And also, you can't hear any of the alarms over there. You can't even hear the bell. Okay. So, the the door that you're referring to, um, please tell your teacher to write an email right away. Um, he may say he already has, I don't know, but I don't remember this on the conversation. That needs to be addressed. I'm sure our maintenance people can fix that pretty quick. The bells. Um, I don't want to make any promises I can't keep, um, but I was just in a conversation. There is a very intense push to get them fixed. Let's just say um, the goal is before April, and I'm being... Uh, we're hopeful much sooner than that. We, I expect you to have bells soon. And I can promise you that this is coming out of this conversation is the recognition that that can't be overlooked a second longer. Um, and just so you know, on our end, it hasn't been overlooked. I can show you the work orders that the folks who work here have been trying, like completing, and it works for a week. I mean, how many of you guys remember you had PAs in early January for like 15 minutes? It's like, yay, hallelujah. And then they stop working again. That's not because of human incompetence. That's from the ancientness of this system. And I think the recognition is, is that there just needs to be a complete expensive overhaul. Let it rip. But they have been trying. It hasn't been completely ignoring it. it it's just it, it, a hundred year old building presents challenges that are unforeseen. And um, we, we need to solve that. And I believe we will and soon. So the band room, absolutely. One thing that's kind of stinky about this plan right now for the band is if, if that alarmed gate does happen to go there, I know that presents an inconvenience for our band folks who like to use that back exit. And um, <coughs> that is something I presented to our engineers, and I'm not sure to what degree we can work around that, but I'm at least advocating for that desire for the band people. I just don't know if we can meet it. I don't think we can turn the alarm on and off. But I just want you to know that it has been addressed. I'm not sure where we're going to end up there. What happened to the students who did regret? Like, where is... I can't talk about that. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I... Please understand. Um, we, we, we have investigated the things that have come up, and um, we have stayed open. So I, I think that's the best I can do with that. Forgive me. Yes? Um, in terms of programs with the police department, when I was little, we had, like, the D.A.R.E. program. Sure. And I remember, like, it was canceled the year before I was supposed to go yeah, into Yeah, I remember that. And I, like, <laughs> like since <laughs> then, <laughs> since then, um, I feel like, you know, like, we have, like, officer suite on campus or whatever. I don't know if people that went to work now know what yeah, talking about. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but I feel like there's been this massive change in just, like, the general not even, not even just like the relations between like our youth and our police department, but also like students aren't getting that same sort of information about drugs and alcohol and behavior, and, you know, mental health awareness. That's, that's all something that you know like Norman Aid does, and I feel like the police department should also incorporate something because you know like this like our we're like the next generation of people, and um, like this is I think this is a pretty big concern of just most parents and. You know, it's, it's a valid concern, and it's our concern as well. 
one of the things that the second, uh, having the second school resource officer allows us to do is to focus on some of those, uh, some of those programs. And we've had some discussions with the PTAs, some of you obviously your parents, uh, because they're, they've put some uh, requests out there for education and training as well. And so you're going to start seeing uh, more of that as, as the program becomes more robust and we, we start to determine, okay, what does it that the community wants? Because uh, there are some things that your, your parents believe it or not would like to know. They want to they wanna have uh, some education as well. And then there's going to be some things that are going to be focused on the student population as well. So those, uh, those pro uh, things are coming, and I know that uh, Lieutenant Hamill is working on that with, um, with the people that work for him. Do you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, and I envision that you guys are going to get a lot of, uh, in, uh, I shouldn't say in-service training, but in-school training, uh, more than just responding to bells. We'll, uh, we'll probably partner with the uh, schools, and we'll be uh, teaching you some uh, different uh, coping techniques as well as uh, some safety techniques. And, and again, if you ever have any questions, uh, please encourage you to contact any officer you see. Um, as long as they're not in the middle of something, you know, uh, you know, if, if uh, they're having a cup of coffee, walk up to them and talk to them. They'll talk to you. We have very approachable officers. And I want to jump back real quick before we get too far away and we lose too many more people. But Mr. me touched on something really important. And uh, the young lady, when she brought up somebody could, a student could be uh, part of the problem. And that's where we need your help. Okay? Nobody has more contact with other students than you. You guys see each other, talk to each other. You know when somebody's having a good day, when somebody's having a bad day, somebody's having trouble at home. And we don't always know that. The school doesn't know that, but you do. If you start seeing some warning signs, that's uh, an opportunity to help us out and maybe prevent or interrupt something that might be coming down the uh, the road here. So again, we and we may have an opportunity to give you more information and how to better do that. But you know, and I know that's a lot to put on your your guys' shoulders as a responsibility. But you know, uh, the Secret Service back in 2004 did a Safe School Initiative study, and they studied 37 events that occurred uh, school shootings, and they found out that there was at least uh, one student or parent or uh, staff member that knew something was going to occur, had an idea that something was going to occur, but they didn't say anything. So with that kind of information somewhere in this school, if you get it to us or get it to a healthcare professional or a counselor or a teacher, somebody you trust, you know, we might be able to prevent something. So that's just as important as putting up fences. to us um, we are trained um, and in a lot of ways obligated to err on the side of caution with these things so when you come to us um, most of the time we're going to communicate with BHPD with officer, uh, with officer Prius you know so you can come to us and it's really not that different than going straight to a police officer does that make sense um, okay. yes Oh, do you want to add to that? I was going to say, yeah. sometimes people just need help. Mm -hmm. And so you shouldn't feel, uh, you shouldn't feel that, it, that, that somehow you're doing this person a disservice. If they're having an issue or a problem, it doesn't always result in a, in a law enforcement solution. Just because we get involved doesn't mean that we're always going to take law enforcement action. Sometimes we can take uh, other actions that, whether it's, we can put, uh, help people with counseling, we can, uh, recommend services to their parents. We can do other things that are not strictly you know, what people see as a, in, a, in the law enforcement realm. And we often do that, especially with our juvenile population. Uh, the last thing we want to do, if we, can, if we can reasonably avoid it, is take some sort of harsh law enforcement action. We have plenty of other tools that we can use to help people. And that's, what, that's our goal, is to, to, is to help people. Um, with everything going on, a lot of you have been talking about your safety, and obviously a lot of people have been asking their teachers what the procedure is um, when the fire alarm goes off. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like my teacher's been saying different things, <coughs> the opposite of everything. And, um, even I've heard from students that like their teacher completely ignore it. I don't know like, what can be done, but that's just really concerning to me because it's a case that's like, real. <coughs> I've heard from so many people that teachers are 
you know, we, we've had quite a number of fire drills this year, right? And exactly zero have been actual fires. So when we hear the fire alarm go off, we start by assuming there's a fire. Um, you know, spe specifically in the village, we've, we've had a little bit more than we should. Um, so I, I normally, we're running into the village immediately and everyone's heads are out of the room and it looks, and you know, you often see teachers like ready to go. Um, you know, the, the ready to go aspect's important. Um, you know, start the exit, and then we call the fire department and say it's a false alarm, get you guys back in class. I mean, that's how it should be, is like mobilize, right? You hear the fire alarm, you mobilize. Um, also, we don't want to lose instructional minutes either, so it's that kind of dance of, you know, but. Being responsive to the alarms is vital. It's really important. Um, and, you know, PA systems functioning, allowing us to say, get back in class, it's all good. Um, you know, it worked for a large portion of, but like literally admins running around just telling people to get back in class, it's okay. Um, you know, it's good that hopefully teachers are responsive. We need to take them seriously, but I also understand um, a little bit of lethargy in the village. You know, I, I get why that's happening. Um, and it's unfortunate, we're working on it. And we do have a couple of ideas we're kicking around to try to reduce the number of fire alarms in the village. Yes. All right, um, so I know some students brought up a concern earlier to me that if we were to put up fences, um, maybe a kid our age could walk into the school that doesn't go to Beverly. Mm -hmm. And um, although it'd be ideal that security guards know everyone that go to Beverly, that's just really not the case. Right. So, um, I mean, because I know some schools like Santa Monica check IDs before kids come into school. And I'm not saying that's what we should do, but mm -hmm. what can the administration do? What can the police do to stop someone that may seem our age but doesn't go to Beverly come to our school? I'll tell you, I had an embarrassing experience once, but it also it illustrates, I think, a little bit more than you might imagine just how familiar we are with people. You know, I, if you walk onto campus, I see you guys every single morning. I say hi to you every single morning. We're looking at your faces. I know many of your names. I think you'd be surprised just how much, like there was one time I saw a student walk on, I was like, what's up with that kid? And we stopped him. We said, hey, who's your counselor, right? It's not as efficient, well, efficient's probably the wrong word. It's not as thorough as checking every single one, but I want you to, to know that like, myself, Mr. Wanker, our security team, I mean, we know you guys better than I think you think we do. Um, Obviously, we don't have um, eidetic memories and you know whatever, but it, it's it's a lot better than I think you might think. That said, um, we are playing around with um, not so much for, for students at this point, but with some software where a guest comes and they swipe their their California ID, and um, it databases who's the guest, and if there's like a red flag on like the Megan's Law or something like that. Um, an alert would come. You know, um, these are steps that we are talking about taking. Um, you know, then you need infrastructure and things like that. I mean, when you think about what we want to do with our campus security, um, everyone wants it done tomorrow, and I get that. And I'm going to do everything I can to make it appear that way. Um, but it's it's an evolution. You know, behaviors have to change. Um, like just walking to different classes and getting used to that. Our security team needs to adjust a little bit. Um, community members who use the JPA need to adjust. Um, so it's, you know, it's a long-term process, but we need immediate action now, especially in specific things like fencing and like those types of things. And we're doing that. Um, but those types of things are great ideas. And um, I was just talking with some of our people, and this is like a flow chart of all the things that have to happen to create a successful, uh, safe school plan. Um, a, a, I should say a closed campus. We already have a pretty si successful plan overall, although we have some pretty glaring holes that we're fixing. But we want to close a campus, there's a lot to it. There's legal aspects, there's human resource aspects, there's JPA aspects, you know, there's a lot to it. Um, so we want to get it right. So we don't want to just rush into something, get it wrong, undo it, do it right again, but we do need to take some immediate steps. And those, those steps like the fence and the bells, I mean, those are immediate and they're happening now. Um, long term, I think there's a lot of room for, for growth, but things like that um, probably won't happen next week. And uh, just so you know, we're visiting a couple schools who have some pretty cool equipment, and we're going to see what they're up to, and maybe inject some of these ideas into our long-term plan. And when I say long-term, I just mean longer than the end of spring break. You know, um, I don't mean like 10 years from now or when we get another bond or something. But you know, I think people want immediate. I get that, and we're trying to achieve that. Um, 
but also we want to be mindful of getting it right the first time rather than, when they say uh, measure twice, cut once, we don't want to do the opposite, you know. Um, but that, these are ideas that, by the way, top, top of this thing to close a campus is talk to stakeholders. And that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're, we're talking to stakeholders. You guys understand you're like probably the main stakeholders. Um, so your ideas and your concerns are ours. So that's a big part of this. Yeah, Sam. Um, so you talked about how you want to put things into action now. Um, I'm just curious, how has the board done in helping uh, make our campus safer? And have they allocated new funds to that idea? What has the board done? I, I can answer part of that. Um, so, a while ago, the board approved a, uh, run up there. Go crazy. So, so a while ago, uh, several months ago, in fact, the board approved a plan to put a fence, uh, which is the same fence that Mr. Mead was talking about, not the long-term wrought iron one that'll go at the conclusion of construction in like six or seven years, but rather the, um, the one that'll go along Heath Avenue and it'll enclose students within the campus. They won't be able to go up front. Uh, the timetable for that uh, it was approved months ago, and uh, it will be up over spring break, uh, according to according to the board. So that's that's you know the first timetable. Um, we're also looking at sec better securing campuses across the district. It's not just the high school; it's a you know conversation at all those schools. And so, over the next several weeks, they are looking at specifically doing that. The reality is that you know we can say, all right, we're going to dedicate this much money to this plan, uh, but but. You know, like Mr. Mead said, it's, it's not just about action for the sake of action, um, but also about making sure that what you do is actually going to be effective. Um, so they're looking to that end, and then there are other issues that we're trying to do, you know, working with site with BHPD uh, to better protect our schools. Uh, at the board meeting last Tuesday, uh, the chief of police, uh, Sandra Spagnoli, uh, presented a new plan uh, for campus safety, uh, which you know, our police officers touched on. It involves you know, increased, uh, you know, more SROs, more juvenile detectives, more uh, traffic officers monitoring and patrolling campuses, um, increased communication with stakeholders, uh, opportunities for anonymous reporting of uh, anything that you guys might be concerned about. So those are all things that the board is, you know, extremely thankful for uh, that the BHPD is offering uh, and that we'd like to pursue. Um, you know, there are other opportunities that the district is looking at. Uh, you know, we, we still have this conversation of how many SROs we want. Um, you know, so that, that's a discussion that we still need to have. Uh, but overall, I think a lot of action is being taken. Um, but, you know, it takes time. Uh, but we, we are making it a priority. Uh, and hopefully, within the next few weeks, you'll notice significant changes. And um, also, when can we expect a second officer on campus? So, uh, once the uh, once the selection process is made, so that can take up to uh, probably two weeks. Then what we have to do is we have to schedule uh, course courses for that. Otherwise, it doesn't mean that that officer won't be on campus, but that officer will be back and forth between training because there is specialized training that we have to send our school resource officers through prior to uh, putting them on campus full time. So you should see the officer. You should get to know, start to get to know this new officer probably. Sometime in March, probably the later part of March. But uh, again, training will be the priority at first, uh, and then once that training is completed, then that, that officer will work hand in hand with uh, the rest of the the detectives and uh, officers in our youth services detail to secure this campus and the other campuses in the district, as well as provide some of the instruction that we talked about earlier, uh, things like cyberbullying or um, uh, internet safety, things like that. that going to be a, a fairly robust plan across the board uh, as it relates to specifically the, the that, that youth services detail. Uh, but that's only one part of this. There are many other pieces to school security that we're working on, such as our the adopt -a school program, which is primarily focused in patrol. And uh, you'll, you'll start to see some of those officers that will begin to integrate with the schools as well uh, as, as, time, uh, as time goes on. And in addition to that, we also have contacts with the, with the federal government, so there's some resources that we are, we're making the connection because we're not technically responsible for the 
fiscal security of the schools, but we want to help and facilitate that whenever we can. So we are making uh, making the link, uh, a link that we made in, I think, 2015. We did our first uh, assessment of the high school, but we're going to uh, help the school do some of those uh, security assessments and provide them some uh, contacts for resources of the federal government as well. We're, we're all in this with the, with you. And, but it's important that you're all in it with us as well. So we need we need both student support, parent support, and we need uh, you know the uh, the staff from the schools and the police department to all work together on the safety program. Prevention is really the most important thing, and and what we really need to do is put most of our effort into prevention. And that's a broad range of of issues, but it comes down to early notification of an issue that we can get involved with, that we can help somebody before something bad happens. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't just mean a school uh, shooting incident. It can be any kind of uh, an incident where uh, some, one of your peers is having a problem or having an issue that we can get involved with early. Prevention is what we want to focus on. Uh, so there was a discussion on the SROs and how they're beneficial and that they kind of become a part of the campus, a part of the community of the school. Um, so what would be some of the negatives, I guess, of having an SRO on each campus? Because I like the Adopt-a-School program. That's a very nice program. But what would be a negative, I guess, of having an additional SRO on each uh, campus? As, as far, what do you mean, what would be a negative? I mean, uh, in addition to the Adopt-a-School program, adopt -a -school program um, what would be the necessity of, of having another SRO uh, on each campus? Well, first off, there's, there, there, there are always immediate resource issues. So one of the things that a lot of times that, that we don't understand is, let, let me just give you an example that it doesn't necessarily, this is not necessarily the reasoning for it, but a lot of people think that uh, we can solve the problem by putting a person somewhere. Um, but when you get a police, when a police officer responds to an incident, what you get is, you know, if the officer is not in his vehicle, what you get is what I'm wearing. You have a you have a very you have a small handgun, some extra rounds, a taser, and a radio. And when you get an officer that's responding to an active incident, what you get is an officer that can put additional ballistic protection on, an officer with a rifle, an officer with a friend with a rifle, and so the officers can be more effective when when they respond to an incident and they can prepare themselves for an incident. It doesn't mean that um, having an officer on campus is necessarily a bad thing, but it also doesn't mean that it's going to be a, it, it's going to be effective in every situation. So what we need to do is balance the resources that we have so that we can provide the best response to any incident that occurs on the campus. And the ideal situation, and the ideal situation we can never plan for, we can never, we, we always hope for, is the ideal situation is to have um, a number of officers at an incident to deal with someone that is a threat to the school. So that we make sure that we don't, you know, not only do, do we not leave a gun, so to speak, because we're shot and we're uh, incapacitated, we don't want to leave a weapon or ammunition there for somebody else to use. So that's why we want to respond and we want to have those resources that we need uh, to respond to the school. An officer in a car can typically respond much faster than an officer on foot. And that's just a fact because I can drive faster than I can run. So uh, again, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's about chance. And so you know, if that officer if there's an officer in the school, in the classroom, where something happens, uh, then that's wonderful, but we can't put an officer in every classroom either. So again, it's, it's about, we can't out-police the problem. We can't put so, you'd have to put so many officers in so many places to ensure that, um, that they can deal with the suspect before it happens. Again, that's why prevention is really the most important thing and needs to be the primary focus uh, of what we do. Part of prevention is the enhanced security for the schools, um, but a, a lot of that is education, is having a system in place to react, to investigate, to deal with uh, a threat before it becomes a real threat. Um, so when you talk about, so when you talk about, is, is it a bad thing? Well, it could be. It, it could be a bad thing, it could be a good thing. It just depends on the, the specific circumstances 
in the threat that we're dealing with at, at that particular time. So, uh, again, it's uh, it, it, it's really situational dependent. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, what would you want us to do in case there's a um, um, in the Florida shooting, some people, you know, kids, like, ran off campus. And then here, some teachers, I hear, they're like, you know, stay here because sometimes we don't know if you're out and about and our priorities, you guys. So what would you want us to do until um, the cops came? Or, like, what, would you want us to stay where we are? Or, or? So, uh, Mike actually so does this training. So that depends on where you are, right? Yeah. So if you happen to be outside of your classroom, and you hear a problem, we want you to run away from the problem. So run to the very furthest place you can go that gets you safety. If you're in your classroom and it's outside, we don't want you running outside into, the, into that. So we want you to you know, hide, lock the door, follow all the, the lockdown procedures of the school. And then if, if hiding becomes an issue, then that's where want you to notify and tell us and we'll start to get there and then you know the last resort is obviously you as a group if you're in the classroom have to fight but that's a last last resort okay is there um, a case where our teachers are going to want us to stay with them and we're outside like say if um we all take a field trip to the field to i don't know observe something um, what would you want us to do if we're just in a wide open space? And the shooting starts yeah. out there. I want you to run. Just run. The farther you get, the, the far, further distance you get away from the shooter, the, the, it's, it's much more difficult for the shooter to be accurate and to do, to do harm, to cause harm. So we want to put distance between uh, any of the, anyone that's innocent, obviously, any vic potential victims and the shooter. So if you hear it, you go away from it. Uh, it also, it helps us, because the fewer people we have to deal with wherever the shooter shooting is occurring, it makes it much easier for us to deal with the threat, because we're going to be able to clearly identify um, at that point where the problem is, or we'll be able to hear it. We won't have the distraction of screaming people, people running through us. Um, that's the other reason we want you to get away from it, or you lock down and hide, so that we can get to wherever it is as quickly as possible. And you know, you all know that we have a very quick response time. Um, and we have, you know, I, I will also tell you that the officers, uh, all the officers, are, they think they're human beings. And they, if they hear that something is going on at a school, that's an opportunity for them. That's not an opportunity, but that's a situation where they're going to make every single extra effort they can to get there as quickly as possible. And so what I would tell you is that, yes, you know, we talk about our response time is under three minutes, but I will tell you that we have responded much quicker and usually do when there's issues at the schools. And that's because the officers will drop whatever they're doing. doesn't matter what it is to get here. Uh, and fortunately, when they get here, they usually get here two, three, four at a time. It's, it's usually pretty, uh, we usually show up in mass and uh, usually very quickly. So. And that's a much better situation for for you all and for the officers to deal with if there's a threat. You 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 don't want. I mean, ideally, if, if all you have is one officer, that's great. But what you want is you want two, three, or four officers here that are working working together, that are working to solve whatever that problem is. It's safer for you all. It's safer for us as well. Thank you. We about done. Okay. No. Sure. Yeah, somebody previously mentioned that uh, a lot of don't know exactly what to do. Like when we had that practice lockdown drill in our fifth period class, my teacher put us like right in like the line of like the window. So if there was a real shooter, he would be able to, or he or she would be able to see right where all of us were. Are there like refresher courses for all the yeah. teachers? So if you're if you're counting, we actually have had four lockdowns or shelter in places this year. I believe it or not. I've only heard one. Like well, there was the first week, remember the one that everything blacked out and we escaped outside. It was like the first week of school. Um, then there was the eclipse one. Then there was the Thanksgiving short day one. That one was 
the, a tough one. And then we just did the one on Tuesday, right? We're, we're getting better. Um, the questions that, that staff is asking are getting more and more specific. Um, but in answer to your question, we are doing a district-wide uh, emergency preparedness, preparedness professional development. Gosh, that was a mouthful. Sometime in early April. Um, I don't have the exact date. I want to say the second or the fourth. Second. So, and it's in conjunction with BHPD. Um, we just had a meeting on Monday in our faculty meeting with uh, Detective Mendoza and Officer Frias where it wasn't just teachers, it was classified, it was as many people as we could cram in, more questions answered there. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of us want to know is everything. Like, what do I do if this, if that, if that, right? Um, and I think you're hearing that it's not quite that simple. So we want to get confident on kind of the basic premises like um, run, um, hide, fight, basically. Um, which is something we're gonna be talking about. And you know, one of the questions came up, do I close the windows, do I open it? And unfortunately the answer is it depends which window. So we're, we're talking through this stuff. And um, one of the things we're hopeful for is not only that your teachers are as confident as they can be, we'd like to get you guys there too. Um, so that you feel confident, so like, you know, you, you would still rely on your teacher because that's the teacher, but you would know just as well as he or she does what to do and how to do it. So we're going for that now, and you've heard some about that earlier today. We're going to get there, guys, and I want you to know that despite the fears and anxieties of last week, um, you have many, many people dedicated to keeping you safe. And I'd like to end, if you don't mind, by thanking BHPD yeah. for being amazing. <laughs> I already knew they were great, you already knew they were great, but what I experienced last week with them was really a great experience. I feel super supported. Um, I also want to give a thanks to, uh, you guys don't probably know this, but our security team, it's not unusual for them to arrive at 7.30 and work until 10.30 at night. I mean, that is a very typical day for them. I want you to imagine that day after day. They're, they're amazing, they're superhuman. And while we're talking about superhuman, I need to also thank my admin team. It's we're here at 6.15 every morning, and it doesn't matter if we're at a basketball game until 10.30 at night. I mean, you have people who are dedicated to keeping you safe, and I can appreciate why maybe right now you're not hearing bells and you're, you're worried about it, but you've got people in this school who literally don't sleep because they care about taking care of you. And uh, I want you to know that it's, it's a lifetime of caring for kids, and you're never forgotten, all right? All right, thanks for coming. Yeah, th yeah, thank you, thank you all. Uh, and just one very quick last thing. If any of you want to get involved further beyond this, we would really love that. Uh, we want to get everyone involved uh, in the walkout March 14th and also in terms of any other events that we uh, hope to hold down the line. So if you guys are interested, you know, of course you're welcome to just stop by the ASB classroom, talk to an ASB member, or also please just contact ASB. You're free to contact me, my email, you know, all of our, all the ASB members' emails, you just go to beverlyhillshighschool.com, you click on the ASB tab, you have all 30 ASB kids emails there. Email us, we want to hear from you, we want to get you involved, we will find a place for you to share your points. So, thank you all for coming, thank you to our guests, um, you guys are awesome, thank you. Thank you.